you will take your Bibles tonight and turn to Revelation chapter 2. And if you remember, uh, tying in with our letters tonight, the, uh, the word I know is found in each of uh, these letters. And uh, Christ knows you tonight, knows you by name, knows our church. And what a thrill that is, as well as a sobering thought that is to know that He knows us. Revelation chapter 2, let's begin in verse 8. And I hope that uh, the videos that we've been showing, we won't maybe do all of the churches, but uh, those that would be of help to you, hopefully that's a help to you this evening. Uh, verse 8 says this of Revelation 2 as we go into the second letter tonight. And uh, this letter is a little shorter than the one to Ephesus, but it begins in verse number 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works. There's those two words I know. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the joy it is to be in this setting tonight. Thank you for these songs and our fellowship together already tonight. Thank you for these folks, Lord, faithful to your house tonight on this holiday weekend. And Lord, as we consider the sacrifices and suffering of previous generations of believers, Lord, we recognize our softness tonight. We recognize, uh, Lord, our proneness to apathy and to half-hearted uh, spiritual activity. And Lord, we know that our greatest enemy is not persecution. It is often prosperity. And Lord, I pray tonight that in the midst of a prosperous country, even with the challenges of our day, God, we have so much that you've blessed us with. I pray, God, that you would sharpen our focus tonight. Lord, you would help us to see how precious the gospel is, how important the mission of the church is. And Lord, may we be willing not only to die for it, may we be willing to live for it. And Father, I pray tonight you would stir in my heart again, anew and afresh, in this area of being a suffering saint that, Lord, you can use mightily for your name. I pray for each person in the room. I pray for young people tonight. You would stir in their hearts, convince them, God, of the cause of Jesus Christ, and may they give their hearts and lives to you. pray for seasoned folks, believers, that, Lord, at one point it was more important to take a stand for you in the workplace and their family gatherings. Lord, give them again the spiritual spine and backbone they need to stand for you. God, I pray tonight you would refine us, you would refocus us, and Lord, help us tonight to leave more emboldened in our faith with a greater compassion for this world. And we'll thank you and praise you for what's accomplished in this setting tonight, in Christ's name, amen. Uh, you can see the graphic before you there uh, this past week. Uh, you've probably noticed I try to find something visually that'll hopefully stick with you, your mind during the week. And so I just put into the Google image search bleeding whatever I was trying to find it and I will tell you I got queasy just looking at pictures of people with you know bleeding arms and legs and I'm not a huge blood person that's just not not my niche and so we have several nurses in our church and I hear some of the stories things they deal with that are just routine things Miss Becky's been a nurse for years Brandy and others and uh, man, I, I, I applaud you, and I'm glad you're there when I show up with whatever injury I have. But me, I, I, I can't do anything to help. I just pass out in the corner. That's my own response to blood and trauma. Uh, and uh, tonight, what we're going to look at is the persecuted church. May I just remind us tonight that what we have and where we are at has not come without not just sweat, but with blood. And uh, there is, there is a, a trail that goes back through church history and Christendom that is strewn with, part, don't mean to be blunt, bodies and blood that's been shed and lives that have been sacrificed. I remember my mother growing up having on the shelf the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. You talk about opening the eyes of a teenage boy. As I read through and 
she was careful in how she dispersed that information, and I would caution you on just handing it to your five-year-old. But in that book is described the graphic um, stand for the gospel that the early believers uh, took. And I hope tonight that God will stir in your heart as he has mine in this area of being firm and resolved in our faith no matter the cost. Now, as you saw in the video tonight, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, Smyrna is a little different than Ephesus. Uh, it is in existence today. You could go to Smyrna. Uh, you could see a lot of the same uh, high rises and buildings that you would see in a larger city, as I mentioned, about a $200,000 or 200,000 population. And they have, uh, it's a large seaport city. And so there's much going on there, but there's much under the earth that uh, has provided the foundation for what we now enjoy. Tonight what I want to look at is how we can benefit from this letter to the church at Smyrna and how we can be more prepared and appreciative of, again, what is worth dying for. So let's look at two messages from Christ to the church at Smyrna that are also, I believe, for us tonight, and we'll bring some application toward the end. First of all, number one, Christ tells the church at Smyrna, I understand your suffering. I will understand your suffering. Jesus Christ knew what this church was going through. Um, right now in Iran, I referenced it on Wednesday night, and I just remind you of it again this evening. There's a gentleman named Saeed Abenedi, uh, who is a pastor in Iran. Uh, he has been repeatedly beaten uh, in prison, thrown back into, uh, he's been in the hospital, now he's back in prison again. But just this past week, they had him in a hospital. They were treating him for some wounds and deprivation he had suffered, and uh, Unfortunately, he was mistreated again in that hospital and thrown back into prison. So that was in the news this past week. And those, that's just one story. Um, I cannot, we just had some missionaries kicked out of China. Um, not one that we support, but affiliated with Brother Tolson that we support. It's going on. It's as real as where we live and what we have this evening. And I just caution you tonight to make sure you have a heart for the persecuted church and that you're willing to learn from it. Uh, we live in a success-driven Christianity, don't we? Wow, that look at the building that church has. Look at the crowd that church attracts. And I will tell you often, that is the antithesis of the church that we find in the book of uh, Revelation. And I just encourage you tonight to be willing to suffer for Christ as God gives us that opportunity. Now, as I mentioned when we began this evening, notice that Christ says in verse number 9, He says, I know thy works and tribulation. And while others may ignore the suffering of this church or be ignorant of this suffering that this church went through, Jesus Christ was not. A couple of things I would give you tonight underneath of that. First of all, number one, Christ understands the location of these believers, the location in which they suffered. Notice again, verse number eight, he says, the angel of the church in Smyrna, in Smyrna. So first of all, he recognizes that they were in a city called Smyrna. He knew where they were. And he communicated to them about the suffering they were experiencing. The word Smyrna means bitter. Um, I don't know if, if another Bible word comes to your mind when you hear Smyrna, but the word myrrh. Um, and in its, in its heyday, especially in ancient culture, they were known as really the only place to get high quality myrrh. Um, and it's just maybe a side note this evening, but what was brought to Jesus Christ manger when he was born by the wise men, myrrh, right? Uh, it's possible, one of the other videos that we didn't show tonight, he talks about and speculates that possibly the wise men on their journey, I mean, visualized from the east coming to where Christ was, that they may have uh, at least bought it at a market or actually gone to Smyrna to pick up frankincense and myrrh. And then also toward the end, remember when Christ's body was to be anointed and the women come with spices? I think we can read between the lines based on the culture that they also were striving to anoint his body with myrrh at, at his death. And it's just fascinating to me that Jesus Christ is a suffering Savior and how intimately he was connected to this place called Smyrna. If you're taking notes, I would maybe jot down just this. This is kind of a side note, but an application in the area of myrrh. Here's the statement. The church has always been most fragrant when it is going through times of suffering. The church has always been most fragrant when it's been going through times of suffering. We want to get the message out, don't we? 
We want to see people saved. We want to see lives changed. We want to see, we want to impact culture. I may I submit to you tonight, the only way that is possible is when we are willing to suffer for Christ. The church has always been most fragrant when it is going through seasons or times of suffering. I read a statement the other day. Someone said this, shared joy is double joy. Shared sorrow is half sorrow. And there's something about Jesus Christ, us sharing in his suffering and him sharing in our suffering that gets us through that moment where we face persecution, we face a look, we face a response by those who do not love and know our Savior. And I just want to encourage you tonight, wherever you're at, whatever you're suffering for the cause of Christ, and I think we all would say it's lesser than these dear folks, Jesus knows where you're at tonight. He knows what you're going through for his name. Some of you have dealt with family for years that just outright mock you when you stand for Christ. You've dealt with neighbors. You've dealt with folks who do not appreciate your stand for Christ. Remember, Christ knows where you're at. Now, if you will, notice the end of verse 8. He goes on to say, all right, write these things, John. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Number two, he also reminds them of their place in eternity. He Remember how we talked about earlier in chapter 1, there's this description of Jesus Christ and all these things that John saw of Jesus now in his glorified state? And remember I mentioned that Christ is going to come back and review those traits as he writes to each church? And he reminds him that death is not the end, and that he himself had died and had conquered death, and he reminds them that there is an eternal existence between this church and and a God who is preparing a place for them. I have a buddy, his name is Tim. You could pray for him. His last name is Groff. I mentioned to some of the men this morning. But on Friday, it was in the Mansfield News Journal this, uh, this week, Tim was on a motorcycle down near Mount Vernon. He's a member of Mount Vernon Baptist Temple. And Brother Fennell was with us for our anniversary of this last year, the pastor. Tim, good guy. And he was... They don't know exactly still what happened because he's been yet to be able to really converse about it. But he was in the middle of kind of nowhere and he stopped real quick and he went flying off of his motorcycle. And what was interesting about the story was they couldn't find him. Around kind of where the road was, there was real high kind of crops and weeds and stuff. And so all they saw, the state, uh, somebody called the, the local sheriff and he showed up and they saw the bike there, but they were trying to track where he was. And some of the wounds that he suffered, obviously he needed immediate attention for that. They finally found him. He's now in the hospital. But he was kind of in the, the, the overgrowth. He was kind of on the, the wayside, and they could not find him. And, and I was thinking of that in relation to our suffering for Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we forget that God knows exactly where we're at. You know, we may crash and burn. We may do something, even ourselves, that brings suffering into our life. But Jesus knows where we're at tonight. We're not lost to his care and his uh, sovereign um, interest in our lives. And may I remind you that our suffering does have bearing upon eternity. If you would, quick application on that. Go back to Hebrews chapter 4, would you please? Maybe these verses came to your mind when you thought on the fact that Jesus can relate to our suffering. And we also can relate to his. Hebrews chapter 4, if you would please, and look at verse 14. And I want to give you a statement after we read these verses that I think will change or at least enhance your appreciation for difficult things that come. And I just want to caution you. We're not talking about crashing motorcycles. We're not talking about um, our own decisions, whether it's our fault or someone else's. We're talking when we stand for Christ and we have pain uh, that is inflicted upon us, emotional, physical, spiritual. Look, if you will, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. And I want, to, I want you to... Focus on these, these verses and how it helps us in our relationship with Christ. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed in the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, all right? And that has the idea of a, a public testimony, all right? Hold to that. Why? How do we do that? Verse 15, for we, us believers, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And obviously, the tempting there is not the the sense of to sin. It is tempting as in trying us. 
God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth He any man. Jesus Christ uh, could not yield to the temptation to do wrong because of His sin, uh, His. Uh, deity, but notice he says, was in all points tempted or tried like as we are yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace. Notice that we may obtain mercy and find grace what to help in time of need. And here's the statement I would give you tonight. Suffering is the context in which great intimacy with Christ is developed. Suffering is the context in which great intimacy with Christ is developed. What did Paul say? That I might know Him. And the what? Fellowship of His suffering. I believe the reason we do not have Jesus Christ at the epicenter of who we are and what we're focused on and why He is not everything to us is because we have not yet suffered enough to draw close to Him. Now I just caution you, be careful what you pray for. But I will tell you this, Jesus Christ and our relationship with Jesus Christ is not the opposite of going through difficulty for His namesake. Don't allow the success, the health, wealth, and prosperity crowd to convince you otherwise. God says, it is sometimes my will for you to suffer. And it is also sometimes best for you that you suffer. And may it just change our view. I always picture Paul and Silas as a kid. I remember hearing that story and thinking, that is so odd. That, how could they have done that? They're in prison singing and praising God. They were kind of worthy to suffer for his name. Where's the singing in our suffering nowadays? Well, you just need to, you need to rethink how you're, you're taking your testimony out in the public. You need to rethink how you approach ministry. Sometimes suffering validates we're doing the right thing. And enables us to experience sweet presence uh, with the Lord. And so just encourage you tonight to be open to the eternal perspective. Christ is trying to remind them, listen, there's more going on here than just your little Smyrna, as tough as it is. I've got something I'm trying to accomplish in and through you. All right, now if you will, go back to our text and look now at verse 9. All right, so he opens with, uh, I understand first of all the location in which you're suffering. It's in Smyrna. Don't forget it's also in the scope of eternity. Notice now the beginning of verse 9. He goes on to say, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Number two, not only does Christ understand their location, number two, he understands the load that they are bearing. Um, the guys in the room would appreciate this. Uh, this past week, Brother Slagle and I pray for their family. They've, Miss Katie, they've had, you guys have just been sick over and over, haven't you? Seems like the last few weeks, pray for them, if you will. He's home tonight with the kids. But uh, Brother Slego and I were strategizing on our men's breakfast. And I will be honest with you, the way a man approaches a church gathering is completely different than a lady, all right? In our conversation, there was nothing about coordinating colors. Uh, There was no discussion of what theme will we do this year. What we talked about, the majority, I would say 90% of our discussion was how much meat do we need at the breakfast? How much sausage, how much bacon, et cetera. And we had a great conversation. The load, bring it, you know. That's all got, what, what are you having to eat? All right, I'll be there. Who cares about all the spiritual things or color scheme or theme? It's a meat theme. And so I encourage the men to come and sign up. We're going to have a great time together. But the load. Do you know when, when we suffer for the Lord, he talks about a yoke. He talks about burdens that he's there with us and he understands what we're going through and wants to sustain us through that. If you're like me, you try to go alone sometimes. I will tell you this just very bluntly. You cannot suffer for the name of Christ by yourself. We've all tried it at times, haven't we? We try to take a stand and then, man, I'm just gonna, just gonna, my sheer personality and wisdom, I'm gonna work my way through this. Yeah, good luck with that. We need the Lord. We need him to bear the load for us as we stand for him. Notice two words found here in verse 9. He says, in reference to their works or their labors, he says, first of all, number one, he understood their load in tribulation. In tribulation. Christ promises them, wow, what a blessing. If you go on down in verse number 10, he says, you shall have tribulation 10 days. He warns them of further tribulation that is coming. And in the video you heard him refer to, there was an expression used in this day of 10 days. 
Um, and it, it meant uh, a period of time, not necessarily 10 literal days, but a period of time. Also, some have supposed it references the 10 waves of persecution that began with Nero uh, and ended with uh, Diocletian and those 10 different waves of persecution. I would just caution you that's not in the Bible, right? But some have made that application, and I would say it, it's at least... It's, it's, a, it's a link that I think can be made based on hindsight that there were 10 waves of persecution from the Roman Empire, um, and uh, it's possible that Christ is referring to that there. Uh, but for what it's worth, Christ promises them even further tribulation. Now, Paul, Paul had a unique perspective on persecution because he started out as Saul the persecutor and then became Paul the persecuted. And that was kind of a rough transition for him. If you remember being, him like being let down the wall in the basket and the church even misunderstood him. But I will remind you in this area of tribulation that none of us are exempt from it. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul says, and Saul says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It, it just goes with the territory. And I think it's interesting that Christ responds to their tribulation by saying you're going to have more of it. So why are we so shocked by it? Why does it ruin our week and our month and throws our whole, our whole tone and mode and attitude off when we receive anything? And let's be honest, how much persecution have we really suffered? You know, it's a look, it's maybe a shut door, it's, you know, someone doesn't talk to us for a few weeks or whatever. Um, man, may we be prepared for that and steeled for that with the Lord's help. Next also, notice he says, I know your, your works and the area of tribulation. Notice, and poverty. And poverty. These saints were faithful in, the, in spite of suffering. They thought they were poor, but notice he says, but thou art rich. Now, if you go over to chapter 3 and verse 17, we see the exact opposite set of the church in Laodicea. Look at verse 17 of chapter 3. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not, all right, they think they're rich, notice not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Man, what a contrast, right? A church that thought they were wealthy that was not, and a church that thought they were poor, and knew they were poor, and Christ said, you are rich. What did he mean when he said they were rich? Well, maybe give, may I give you a couple of verses? Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, all right? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and if you're taking notes tonight, if you don't get to all of these, I'd invite you just to write them down and later in your own study. I hope you've been meditating on the book of Revelation as I have and letting it work in and through you. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and if you will, verse 10. Um, this church is poor from a human's perspective. This church has, is destitute. Many of them were in prison when they received word of this letter. And yet Christ said they were rich. How so? Look at 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 10. He says this, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. And if you go back through the previous verses, he talks about what Paul's talking here, everything he suffered, and all the afflictions, and all the stripes, and all the imprisonments, and the fastings and all of those things, and yet he says at the end of verse 11, or verse 10, possessing all things. We're rich. We have Jesus Christ tonight. We have His Spirit living within us. We have His Word before us. We, we, in our country, we have so many things that only further enrich that experience, let alone eternity. Don't forget that. We're wealthy. And, uh, you know, the I want a mansion over the hilltop. Maybe there's a few little theological issues I have with that song, but the principle is there. He, he owns everything, and someday we're joint heirs with Christ, and we inherit all of those riches. Don't forget that in the midst of suffering. One other verse, James chapter 2, if you would please, in this theme of wealth in the midst of suffering. James chapter 2, and if you would please, verse 5. James chapter 2 and verse 5. James here says this on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Hearken, my beloved brethren, James 2, 5, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, I like this next, this contrast, poor of this world, notice, rich in faith, 
Why are they rich in faith? Notice here's their focus. And heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him. One of the things I would just caution you with is don't get caught up in the kingdoms of this earth described in Revelation. I'm talking the earthly kingdoms, even the Jewish kingdom. Remember, we're not of this world. Christ's kingdom is not of this world. And though he comes and set up his millennial kingdom and does all of that in his interaction with this planet, it's ultimately about an eternal kingdom, a kingdom that never ends. He rules forever. And in that kingdom is great wealth and great riches. And I don't think we're going to be living in grass huts. We're not, sorry for you camping people, living in tents in the middle of nowhere. If that's your heaven, maybe. I don't know. God will give that to you. But I think it's going to be a place of wealth and riches. And I'm not saying that put some seed money in or whatever, again, the prosperity gospel. I'm just saying God has rich things to give us. Read Ephesians 2 sometime. Remember we talked about that last week? He's going to spend all of eternity demonstrating the riches and the wealth of his love and his provision. You will not miss out. And don't let the world tell you otherwise as you suffer for the name of Christ. And by the way, Christ himself demonstrated a willingness to be impoverished upon this planet. 2 Corinthians 11, or 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, that's an understatement, isn't it? Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And if Christ was willing to do it, should not we as well as his representatives? Here's the statement tonight, and we'll move on. You have to choose between the prosperity gospel and the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are not the same. We must be willing to suffer to experience fully the riches that Christ offers. All right, number two, if you will, now go back to our text and look at the end of verse 9. All right, so Christ says, first of all, I will understand your suffering. He said he understood the suffering here in this church, and he gives to us the message that he will understand our suffering. Notice now the end of verse number 9. As if they don't have enough to deal with. Notice he says, And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Number two, and we'll get to it more in verse number 10. Christ says, number two, I will, under, I will uh, use your suffering. Should be used there, I'm sorry. I will use your suffering. Jesus Christ says, I will use your suffering. Um, I saw the other day a, um, a sticker on the back of a car, and it said this. It was kind of a lengthy statement, but the guy had on the back of his car said this, if we are not meant to have midnight snacks, why is there a light in the refrigerator? Um, we are naturally indulgent, aren't we? I can see some of you, you know, I can visualize you in the middle of the night getting up and emptying a tub of, it's not quite a gallon anymore, right, Brother Chuck, but a quart and a half. We were talking about how uh, how uh, vendors now and retailers are shrinking their size. And Brother John, your company is as guilty as any. But we, no, I'm just kidding. We were joking about that Wednesday night. I offended all the Smuckers people and all the Smith Dairy and anybody else we had in our service, how they're shrinking the sizes. But I can see you indulging yourself and getting something that you want. And I think we see how those pleasant things are used. But may I submit to you this evening, Jesus Christ uses our suffering for his plan and his purpose. Here's the thought tonight. If God is sovereign, if God is control of every little nuance of your life and mine, would we not be willing to trust that he's trying to control and use the difficult moments in life? See, I like to talk about when God made a banner moment, God just did something. But sometimes the suffering that maybe is chronic that goes on and on and on, would we be wise to see tonight what God is trying to do in that? And I have observed as we go out, we had a great faith in action this last Wednesday. If you missed it, we're going to start probably doing those more regularly before church on Wednesday night if you're able to get here from work. And uh, I've noticed when we go meet people and invite people, we're competing with churches, if that's the right expression, that just cater to their every need. We'll make it as easy and convenient and comfortable as we can. I think you got to do as much as you can in that area. But man, we're missing so much of what God can do in our lives as believers when we sidestep something God has brought in our life that is suffering. All right, a couple things that Christ uses that are found in these verses. Number one, I like this one. He uses the devil. All right, he uses the devil. All right, there we go. 
I don't know what I did there. I went backwards. Number one, Christ uses the devil. Christ uses the devil. Notice, if you will, the end of verse number nine. He talks about this synagogue. They think they're Jews, but notice he says they're not of the synagogue of the Jews. They're of the synagogue of Satan. And he goes on to talk about these people. Now, here's the question tonight. How does Christ use a time of suffering to really defeat the devil and even use the devil, his even attacks themselves to accomplish his purpose? Well, a couple of areas. Number one, first of all, in the area of contrast. In the area of contrast. Did you pick that up in the video that the, the believers, their, their sincere acts of worship and um, piety were, were, were twisted? You know, the whole brother-sister thing meant they were anti-family. The term love was twisted in an immoral way. Um, I thought it was interesting that Christians have never, and this church never had the position that it actually became the body and blood of Jesus Christ, transubstantiation, but they were charged of being cannibalistic. They were literally eating uh, the body of Jesus Christ. And, and the, the attacks were not coming from Romans. They were coming from these, this crowd here that were leveling these attacks, and God used this moment to create contrast between true believers and those who claimed Jesus Christ that were not. I believe Satan is behind every persecution that comes our way. I believe that. But I will tell you many times what he uses is religion. Isn't that interesting? It's not the pagan Roman culture. It's the Jews. Paul Who was his greatest source of enemies and resistance? It was the Jews. It just talks about the Jews this and the Jews that, and they met him in the next town and sought to further persecute him. In fact, in four of the seven letters that we have in these two chapters, Satan is mentioned specifically. And in the other three, he's behind the scenes somewhere working. Anywhere you have a church, you have Satan. Don't miss that, all right? He's right there seeking to rend and destroy and divide. And when you and I get on each other's nerves and there are moments of friction, see it for what it is. When others attack us from the outside, see it for what it is. And that is the source is the devil. Here's the statement tonight. It is only during times of persecution, listen to me, that there is a true contrast between those who truly are following Jesus Christ and those who are not. And I believe God uses seasons of persecution to make that absolutely clear. Um, I think in our country, we have some shifts going on, though they concern me at face value, it's forcing people to decide. Do you believe marriage is one man with one woman for life or not? You have to now decide. And I'm amazed by churches, so-called, that vacillate and keep trying to straddle the fence on these issues that clearly, not just the issue, but the pushback from those stands We have to choose. And I believe it's only in those seasons of persecution that religion is separated from true followers of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you remember the story in 07 of uh, the uh, gentleman on uh, Virginia Tech's campus. I have a good friend that ministers at a church in Roanoke. And uh, in Roanoke is Virginia Tech. And they had um, an attack done by a senior student there. And he ended up... um, just going on a shooting spree and hurting and maiming and uh, killing several of the students there. But there was a story told of a gentleman named Liviu Lebrescu. And as as this this student was working his way through the school and uh, wrecking havoc there in different sections of the the campus, he was met in one classroom by this 76-year-old wily Romanian guy. And uh, the story is told that this Romanian Jew, uh, he survived the Holocaust and was working on staff on campus there at Virginia Tech. And he basically put his body and put whatever he had in front of that door, and he, he guarded that door until everybody in his classroom could get out the windows behind him. And he ended up giving his life um, for those students. There were 20-something students that were saved because of that man his willingness to do whatever it took to make a difference, even when it costs much. Do you know that those moments, we respect that man more. We would never know the boldness and courage he had, the selfless sacrifice that he could make if that moment had not been there. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, 
But there was a contrast between the gunman and that man, was there not? Because of that difficult moment. And it is often in seasons of suffering that it's not that it determines our faith, it merely reveals our faith. And I think we ought to be thankful for those moments of clarity where we get the look, we get the response, we get the feedback. Sometimes even we lose out in vocational setting or we lose out in the family setting because we stand for Christ. Look for what it can reveal. Look for what it can contrast. See, the crucible of adversity is the moment when our heart is shown to the world, whether it's faith or it's just shallow, convenient religion. And so it gives for us contrast. See, the God, God can use the devil. He can use the devil to contrast your faith, if it's sincere, with that which is not sincere in the world. All right, next, if you will, look at verse 10. There's a second way in which the Lord, and specifically Jesus Christ, can use the devil in seasons of difficulty. He says, fear none of these things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Notice the next statement that ye may be tried. Number two, it also provides for us refining. God can use the devil, excuse me, to refine us. Do you remember the gentleman who was in sin in the church at Corinth? What, what was the motivation for them to separate from that man? We won't get into the, the blatant sin that was there in the church. But they said, separate from him to deliver his flesh to whom? The devil. And what's interesting, in the second letter in Church of Corinth, the guys, Paul's saying, welcome him back in. He's been refined. He's been purified. And God can use the devil to do that. Um, this past week, I had a smile on my face as I was working in my front yard. I had someone in our church uh, find somewhere a lawn edger. I've never used an edger. How many of you have an edger that you use? All right, a few of you, you OCD people like me. And I've always wanted one and just never could justify it. Uh, and so I had one given to me. Well, this last week, finally, for the first time ever in my life, I edged my yard. And just a smile the whole time because now my yard, everything's just nice and neat. It looks crisp. And I think I need to do it again this week just to feel the, the high again of edging my yard, you know, refining it, making it a little more shapely and attractive. Some of you, you mow your yard four or five times a year. You, you don't even know we're in the same plane as I am, okay? That's been me most of my life too. But the refining process, God wants to trim, God wants to edge, God wants to refine us. And I think one of the first tools that God grabs is difficulty, suffering, even demonically infused persecution. He uses that. May we be open to that as God chooses to use it. And I believe it's why often we look at the early church and we say, why can't we be more like them? I would love to have the power. I'd love to see the miracles. I'd love to see thousands saved in a day, but I'd opt out of the persecution. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. And so God uses the persecution to refine us and prepare us for what he has next. All right, now if you will, look at the end of verse 10. There's a second thing that Christ uses in these seasons of difficulty, that if we'll yield to him, he'll accomplish his will. Look at the end of verse 10. He goes on to say, uh, that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto, what's the next word? Death. Number two, Christ also uses death. Christ also uses death. I saw the other day, and this did not happen in recent days, but it was a... Um, a monument like a, that a husband had erected in memory of his wife who had passed on. And it said this, quote, here lies Jamie Smith, wife of Thomas Smith, marble cutter. This monument was erected by her husband as a tribute to her memory and a specimen of his work. Monuments of this style are only $350. Man, what shameless promotion using death for commercial interest. Can you imagine seeing that? Do you know what Jesus Christ, Christ uses our death not to um, just his own end and not just his own selfish agenda. He uses it to accomplish his will. Can I ask you tonight who is in charge of death? Who allows death? Who conquered death? Who will someday end death? God. And so God can use death. And I'm not here tonight to discourage you. Wow, thank you. If, if I die, God's going to use that. That's really encouraging. But God uses death. 
May we tonight yield to that, what God's purpose is in the midst of suffering. These folks said, Christ said to them, you will die. Be faithful unto death, I'm using it. How so? Two things and we're done tonight. Number one, first of all, for reward. For reward. Notice he says at the end of verse number 10, and I will give thee, what? A crown of life. We studied on the different crowns a few months ago, but Christ says, if you die for me, I will give to you the crown of life. Can I give you tonight very quickly, and just we won't get into them, but four reasons why God allows people to suffer that I think really are crowning uh, blessings. And if you'll just jot these down very quickly, I think we struggle with it, don't we? Man, they're a good person. Man, they're trying to do right, and man, here comes new suffering, new difficulty. Here are the four reasons. Number one, to administer discipline. All right? To administer discipline. And I will give you a reference, and later you can look at these. All right? Four reasons why God allows and even orchestrates suffering uh, in our lives. Number one, to administer discipline. You could put down there Hebrews chapter 12, and it's really most of that chapter that talks about that, the chastening of the Lord, His correction. Number two, it is to create prevention, all right? It is to create prevention. That is to keep us from doing something. It is to provide friction. It creates prevention. Um, you remember in um, specifically the Lord's Supper observance that some sleep, some have died. Why? God said, you've been sinning, and I'm going to stop that sinning, and here's how I'm going to do so. And so he uses suffering or death to accomplish that. Number three, uh, to learn obedience. To learn obedience. By the way, uh, 2 Corinthians 11 would have been the chapter for the previous one. Number three, learning obedience. Put down Hebrews 5 and verse 8. Remember, it talks about Jesus Christ learned obedience, and he learned it through suffering. And then the last one, and this is one we're after tonight, the fourth one would be this. So administering discipline, creating prevention, learning obedience. And number four, here it is, providing testimony. Providing testimony. Think about some of the greatest biographies you've ever read or at least people you've heard of that have made a lasting uh, contribution to humanity, maybe to Christianity. They were suffering souls, weren't they? Man, Corrie ten Boom. Uh, Heidi and I were able to be in Amsterdam. We at least tried to find her little apartment there and, um, and uh, at least saw that and saw some of what was a part of her existence. I mean, just so many that have suffered so much. What makes them significant? How does God use them? Because He allowed them to suffer and therefore gave to them testimony. Uh, one verse on that real quick. I think we have time. Would you go to Matthew chapter 5? Matthew chapter 5. Be careful what you wish for when you say, God, use me mightily. God, elevate opportunities for me to stand for you and represent you. Part of that prayer being answered will always be difficulty. Matthew chapter 5, and if you would please, verse 10. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10. And I just encourage you tonight, if you want to be among the few, you want to be among the chosen of God, um, this chapter, these verses are for you. Look at verse number 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall, shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. Notice, for my sake. Now notice verse 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And Christ talked about that reward in Revelation 2. Notice the end of the verse. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Here's the thought I would give you tonight. When we get to heaven... Though I don't enjoy the suffering here, I think many of us will be ashamed by the suffering we dodged when we stand before guys like Polycarp. When we stand, I mean, think about some of the people we will see. And that one th question I have about the glorified body for the believer is, will that glorified body bear the scars if those scars are scars of martyrdom? Christ's body does. I don't know that for sure. But Paul talked about he bore in his body he had the scars and the wounds of representing Jesus Christ. And in that moment, anything we suffered will bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. And I think so often our view is different than that. We're in a good group when we suffer for Christ. In fact, it's normal. 
It's as normal as breathing. It's as normal as opening our Bible is entering a day in which there's resistance, there is persecution. And I would ask you tonight, do you really want the rewards that God offers? If you do, you're willing to suffer for Him. Now lastly, if you will, go back to chapter 2 of Revelation and look at verse 11. And here's where now he brings the application of the letter, not just to the church at Smyrna, but to us as a New Testament church today. Verse 11, he that hath an ear, Revelation 2, 11, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Remember, each one of these, this letter was not just to this one church, but it is to all of the churches, including us. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Number two, not only does Christ offer to us De- uh, through death reward, but also through death He offers to us life. He offers to us life. Can you imagine meeting one Sunday wherever they met and you fellowship together and when you gather the next time together someone new has died for the cause of Christ? I, I can't even imagine that. Can you? And weekly, that regular occurrence, and yet Christ reminds them there's new life coming. This is not the end. I've conquered death. You also will conquer death as you are faithful to the end. Mark 8, 35, Christ said, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. The enemy may kill our body, but the enemy has no control over second death, which is hell, which is ultimately the lake of fire. Someone said this, those who are born twice will die only once. Those who are born only once will die twice. And if you are born again, that, that expression has been overused in our day, but if you are truly born again based on John 3, you will never die that second death. When we, if we die, and by the way, all of us will die in one way or the other. The word death just means separation. I'd rather die in that sense through the rapture, wouldn't you? But I will tell you, when we are separated from this body, we now enter into a glorified body. So what's bad about death? I know it's hurtful, it's painful, it's something that evokes fear in our hearts, but it's the means by which we experience eternity. You really want to be stuck with your body forever? Your brain, your heart, your whatever? I'm thankful that God allows us to pass from uh, this physical death into eternal life. And so... May we be faithful even in the midst of death, anticipating life. One last verse. Would you go to James chapter 1? James chapter 1 tonight. Appreciate your attention. James chapter 1, and if you would please, verse 12. James chapter 1 and verse 12. And this would be one of the other references to this, this term, crown of life, this reward. Notice what he says here. James chapter 1 and verse 12, which by the way, James died for his Lord, did he not? He's one of the first martyrs of the early church. Look at verse 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive, notice, the crown of life, the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. I don't know if you've thought about if death is the only alternative to denying Jesus Christ, what you will do. I've thought of it, especially as I read these accounts. But I will tell you, the only way that's possible is number one, by the grace of God. And number two, by focusing less upon the persecution and more upon the face of Jesus Christ. Seeing Him, loving Him, surrendering to Him no matter the cost. I read the other day of a story of a a zookeeper an elderly gentleman that for years had worked in this zoo, and he was cleaning out the, the uh, pen of a wildcat, and uh, there was a man watching this elderly gentleman perform his duties he had been doing for decades. And the attendant, uh, attendant entered the cage through the door on the opposite side of where this wildcat was, and the gentleman went in, he had nothing in his hands except just a little broom. Carefully, he closed the door. He proceeded to sweep the floor of the cage. The person outside observed that he had no weapon. He had no real attention that he gave to this wildcat. In fact, he poked the animal with the broom as he walked by to clean the other side of the cage. 
Wildcat hissed at him and then just moved and laid down in another corner. The man watching this said to the attendant, you certainly are a brave man. No, I'm not brave, he replied as he continued to sleep, uh, sweep. Well, then that cat must be tame, said the observer. No, came the reply, he, he is not tame. If you aren't brave and the wildcat isn't tame, then I can't understand why he doesn't attack you. The observer said he heard the man chuckle and he replied with an open air of confidence, Mr. He's old and he ain't got no teeth. Do you know that's ultimately the, the end of the devil? He can't have us. He can throw everything he wants at us. And maybe some of that's coming our way in the near future, but I'll tell you, he's lost his hold upon us. He's lost his fangs. Someday his authority will be all gone. He'll be bound in a bottomless pit, and someday uh, he will be uh, left in the lake, cast in the lake of fire, and we move forward into glory with the Lord. Don't allow his immediate attacks to distract you from what God has promised is his future and is our future. And here's the, the thought I would give you as we leave. Could it be God wants to use the suffering in your life? Could it be that God is in control of that which is difficult in your life? I don't know what the malady is. It could be even something where there is an open attack, but it's just living in a sin-cursed world. Could it be God could use that? Christ told this church, I am using it. I understand it, and I'm using it for my purpose. Let's pray together. Father, thank you tonight for your word. Thank you for the joy it is to see.